Why do people quit making stuff? I'm Dr. Peter Allen. I'm a bioanalytical chemist. Internet sociology is not my area of expertise, but I have been very on the internet since before web pages were invented, when the internet was Usenet and Gopher. I've seen a lot of great creators come and go, and I have some theories. Why do they quit? Maybe it's sudden and dramatic. Maybe the new stuff slows down to a trickle and then slows more, and then we all just assume it's over. Here are some hypotheses as to for why a creator we like might have up and quit making stuff for the internet. This is not a complete list. Hypothesis 1. The mob drove them out. The same infrastructure that enabled a million subscriber YouTube channel can also make a million man mob. The mob can direct a lot of cruelty and hatred at a person. It's like distributed bullying. Yeah, people do make mistakes, and there are consequences, but they're not necessarily proportionate. See, there's a problem with mob tactics. Some people love conflict and thrive on it, and so the mob's vitriol doesn't affect them. They use the conflict to get a following, cultivate a backlash to farm more clicks, and I do not like those people. Others feel the mob's hatred and are traumatized by it. It hurts them because they want to reconcile with the people who hate them, because they want to be decent people, and the mob drives those people to quit creating. So mobbing is like a poison that kills the crops and fertilizes the weeds. Almost as bad as for the victim, it poisons the perpetrators. Participating in that mob it feels good, but it undermines any chance at building the community. Mass hate can make a person quit, even if there's a lot of love and support still there for them. Hypothesis 2. The dopamine cycle crashed and burned. So there's a dopamine rush you get from scrolling and scrolling and scrolling and then finding something relevant or funny or entertaining or that feels like the capital T truth. You get the same dopamine rush when you tear open the present on your 8th birthday and receive the toy that you coveted. And that happens once in a while on the internet. For me, the latest one was a comic by Last Place Comics. I'll put a link in the description, but it might be very specific to my sense of humor. I was scrolling Reddit, I saw this comic, and literally laughed out loud. I used that word and phrase correctly. I stopped scrolling, put my phone down, and belly laughed. I figuratively scour the internet for that experience every day, and most days I do not find it. When we're kids, up to about age 12, we get a lot of happiness and satisfaction from material things. The things themselves, collecting them, playing with them, owning them, are a source of pleasure. Having a katana sword was awesome when I was 10, but it seemed meaningless by the time I was 13. I wanted the experience. I wanted to be left alone to play games with my friends. Now, even though it was the experiences that I wanted, experiences that I still want, I was frequently distracted by the objects, the accoutrements, the cards, the toys, the equipment that were associated with that experience. And that is a trap. See, our needs mature, but our strategies for filling those needs often don't. We accumulate material things, or we scroll and scroll and scroll for the next virtual thing to have. And that activity, shopping or scrolling, it takes up the space in our lives that could be spent on real experiences, real friendships, relationships. Worse, these activities leave us unfulfilled and hungry for more. That's convenient for the platform because we stay engaged, but it's not healthy for our psyche. I'm bored. Producing content is the mirror image of that whole problem. It's addictive to watch the metrics go up. It's a lot similar to the addictive doom scroll. And let's face it, content dealers, as it were, are also big time content junkies. If a person doesn't get their dopamine hit frequently enough, well, what happens? Now, according to Psychology Today, when the brain releases dopamine in rewarding bursts, you experience a deep intrinsic satisfaction along with increased motivation and curiosity, perseverance, and memory. To get the dopamine pleasure response from challenges achieved, you need to plan for your brain to experience frequent recognition of incremental progress. After a while, making content may not yield those frequent dopamine bursts. Producers and consumers alike can build up a need for those bursts, but be unable to fulfill them with the activities that worked semi-reliably before. Like the kid who always needs a bigger toy to open, eventually the presents run out. Content creators may quit because the act of producing content doesn't produce that dopamine rush anymore. Call it creative burnout, call it hedonic adaptation. In the end, the rewards are no longer frequent or proportionate to the work and the creator quits. 
Hypothesis three, content creation stops providing value. The late great David Graeber said that the internet was really not much more than an efficient post office, mail order catalog and public library. Now the internet really isn't good for much more than that. It can do much more than that, but not much of it is good. The exception is community building, and we'll come back to that. At one point, people were excited about the lack of gatekeepers on content creation, but the job of gatekeeper existed for a reason. It existed to preserve the scarce resources. There's only so much paper and ink, so many good creators, and we don't want to waste productive resources on things for people who can't afford it. But the internet removed that scarcity. It replaced it with a different scarcity. Eyeballs, brain bandwidth, attention. The rise of the common section, engagement optimization metrics, and advertiser surveillance capitalism has profoundly changed the media game. Attention is now more scarce than the things that might occupy it. A market has organized itself around amassing that resource and selling it. Accumulate eyeballs, get a following, leverage that capital to get a business running? Well, that's not new. That's what content creators are trying to do. What's new is the intentional breeding of human misery in order to keep people attached to the feed, to farm attention. That's the scarce bit, and that's what platforms do. That's the organizing principle around hate mobs. It's the selection pressure driving the evolution of fake news. It exploits the unhealthy relationship between the content producers and the productified audience. See, I finally understood that Web 2.0 was different when I really understood the difference between following a bunch of blogs on one hand and looking at my Facebook homepage on the other. See, I still organize my favorite blogs and web comics into a chronological inbox using RSS. I'm a site called Feedly. Now, I thought, mistakenly, for way too long, that was essentially what Facebook and Twitter were doing. They were blogging platforms with social features organized into an inbox containing the posts from the people in my social circle. But that's not what Web 2.0 is. The real Web 2.0 is the feed. The feed is not chronological. It looks kind of similar on the surface, but the average user may not even know that Facebook and Twitter are very, very different, but they are prioritized curated. They are designed around the same principles as a slot machine, because we're not the customer, we're the product. The gatekeeper is back. It is the algorithm, and it is gatekeeping access to the audience instead of the content. Content has three ways of getting attention. It can be educational, spectacular, or engaging personally. There are mirror image ways for content to provide value. Content can disseminate actionable information, it can distract us from something unpleasant, or it can serve as a hub to build community. But there's a lot of content that gets attention without actually providing value. Conspiracy content provides no actionable information. News provides a distraction from local unpleasantness by providing a window to other people's greater unpleasantness. Personality-driven content feels like having a friend but it does not provide any real community. The algorithm, the gatekeeper, is biased against real value because real value is satisfying, and satisfied people tend to stop viewing. When creators get a sense of this, when they realize they are creating something that's more like an addiction than like nourishment, they either care or they don't. And if they care about providing real value to their viewers because they are decent people, then they'll find some way to provide a real value or they'll quit. I hate it when people explain stuff, but don't point out an opportunity for action. If I could make a rule for everyone writing a think piece or an opinion article, it would be this. Include a call to action. And I don't mean like, share, and subscribe. I mean, if your information is not actionable, then it's not really worth providing. The value of educational content is actionable information. I'm going to do better about this in my videos. In that spirit, here are some things you can do, things that I'm trying to do, that might actually help this situation. First off, we can support things with subscriptions whenever possible. Patreon is a good step in that direction. YouTube Premium is better than YouTube Ads. But the beautiful thing about the subscriber-supported model instead of an advertiser-supported model is that the incentives are different and so communities can be different. If you like a creator, consider supporting them directly. If you can't support or give money to the creators you like, well, then give them a like or a share or, you know, promote their content on Reddit. 
help them find the people who can afford to support them. We work with the platforms we have, not the platforms we want. Consider getting involved with the community that supports some content producer. The big value that a creator can provide to his audience is to act as a hub for a supportive community. Possible action two, avoid advertisements. Now I subscribe to YouTube Premium. I don't know if the feed's different for premium subscribers, but there is a different incentive structure. YouTube Premium wants you to enjoy and be satisfied and then log off. They want you to stop using their resources. Download stuff, listen, watch later, save the bandwidth associated with repeatedly streaming. But ad-supported YouTube wants you to be engaged as much as possible, streaming as much as possible. They want to serve you as many ads as possible. If you can't afford YouTube Premium, well, get an ad blocker. Advertising is incentivizing the platform in ways that is bad for audiences and creators. Possible action three, sort your feeds chronologically. It's a minor thing when it comes to helping creators, but a chronological inbox makes it more likely that you will see the things you actually subscribe to instead of the things that the algorithm is pushing. Pay attention to what you pay attention to. This is really meta, but attention is a finite resource, so give it to the things that actually fulfill you. Point your browser to youtube.com slash subscriptions, not the homepage. If you want to be on Twitter, and I recommend you don't, but if you do, use workarounds. You can use realtwitter.com at time of recording and sort by latest, and at least you get a chronological feed that way. I don't believe that Facebook can be saved. Fourth, and most importantly, touch grass. Get off the internet. What about you, Dr. Allen? Is your PhD in hypocrisy? Why don't you get off the internet and do something outside? And fair enough. You know, here's a video of a beaver that I saw on my walk the other day. Did I compromise my offline moment by taking a video for you guys? Was I thinking of making content instead of reveling in the experience of seeing a wild beaver for the first time? Yeah, maybe. Anyhow, thanks for watching. I will be back in two weeks. I am moving to a bi-weekly schedule. Isn't it frustrating that bi-weekly means both twice per week and every two weeks? English is literally insane. See y'all later.